Tennessee, Tennessee. Yeah. 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 They were on their honeymoon. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You were the first person who was the first person. You say, the first person. You can't tell me. You're back on top of the picture. I've got a house. You're going to get old. She's great. You're going to drink. You're going to drink. Especially the yeah. Jonas with their yeah. twins. They have twin babies. And they're new. And yeah, they're new. I sent him the I sent him the slide yesterday. And he said, Oh, that's cool. Why don't you send it all the cell phone? I have to make manuscripts because with my AD, if I get off track, I I can I taste rabbits like crazy. So I have to use manuscripts. I don't, I don't use half of it, but I at least take it all out. That's very good. Thanks for it. Oh, you're welcome. Appreciate you. Good night. Oh, I mean, yes. yes. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At our church, we're all good. Okay. We do that for three, three, four K points. We got one after another. And then we get switched over to you. And that's the one 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 that's I just don't like wondering the same. Yeah. They changed so, the camera with Casey. Yeah. When we see it, it's a thing. I, I haven't gotten it. It's a messy bus. Yeah. Okay. I'm not scared of jumping in. Right, right. Oh, you're going to be in the car. In fact, Cody, he was down the best. Right. 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 Yeah. But, but thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. That hooker and mic is yours. Yes. The hooker and mic is mine. Yeah, you can put it up there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Hey, I'm Blake. How are you doing? Good morning. Nice to meet you. 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 Well, I was going to say, are you running it this way? No, I have got two. Thank you. Everything's already said. It's already been said. I've already been told. I'm going to get this job. Hey, you in here, boy? Jamie struggles yesterday. I see a green that dot, so.
Okay. It's not like I'll do it tomorrow anyway. Get about it, so that's what I thought. only way I know to introduce Brian, which is not that deeply because we haven't known each other that long. Okay, so I can't say the types of things in here about Brian as I could in the other room as have been doing in the other room with some other guys. But here's what I do know and one of the best, here's, here's what I, have you ever heard the phrase, and you're going to think, how does, you know, how does he know my upbringing? I don't, but I'm going to use it as an illustration. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You ever heard that? Yeah. And that's a common expression. We're usually meaning referencing somebody's upbringing, their, their parents and their children, how they were raised, and that sort of thing. Some aspect like that. I'm going to do that with churches. All right? If the tree is the Mount Juliet congregation, they've had for a long time some really good apples. And I don't just mean in the membership. Uh, as a wonderful, active, faithful congregation in the community. That's, but I'm talking about staff. They figured out a long time ago how to hire really, really good staff. I feel like a little, I know a little bit about what he's doing out there for the friends that I have out there, both on staff as his co-workers, as elders, and people I know in that community. And so, as an involvement, outreach, discipleship minister, I know he's doing that well. And for what we know is happening out there, he needed to be here to talk to this group about how to do it. That congregation, that staff, and this guy knows exactly what it means to be involved in discipleship. And that's why he's here. And if that gives him a little credibility to walk it back a little bit because you didn't know anything about him, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. And uh, they hired him. They believe in him. They like him. I know this. And I know he'll do a good job in here. Give me your attention. Brian Lamasters from the Mount Juliet congregation, about 25 to 30 minutes due east of here. Oh, thank you so much, Andy. All right, I'm going to grab this door just so... Noise is not loud. Hey, Michael. All right, jump on in. Um, all right, who's had, just real quick, I only want to spend like a minute on this, but because I know we can go back and we can watch other sessions. If maybe has got a session that they've been to so far that was really beneficial, somebody want to throw it out? Anybody had one? Matt Wallace. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. Anybody else had one? Be our guest. All right. All right. I just came from the auditorium with Dan. I thought he did a really good job. He kind of walked through how he has a Bible study with somebody. So if that's something that interests you as well, I encourage you to go back to that one. I know Philip did one yesterday about Take Root. I've used that resource as well. Um, today, we're going to take a different approach, I would say, than that angle on it. Our conference theme is Disciples Making Disciples. But for today, I want us to look at that first part of that, which is disciples. Um, as church leaders, as those that are helping lead our congregations, I want us to look at our disciples within our church family. 
um, and kind of explore that, ask some questions, do some self-reflection uh, on that. I hope I ask us some difficult questions, questions that challenge us, and I don't mean to undermine us by any means, but I want us to challenge us. But if you are leading at your congregation, I just want you to know that I appreciate you. I love you. If you're an elder that is in here, I think you have the most difficult uh, job in the world. I have so much respect for elders, uh, especially any of mine that may be listening to this. But no, <laughs> but but for real, I appreciate you guys. You you have one of the hardest jobs. I know it's very rewarding at times as well uh, to shepherd the flock. But I want us to look a lot of what are we talking about when we look at disciple. I am the disciple discipleship minister at Mount Julius. So people ask me all the time, like, so what does that mean? Like, what do you actually do? Uh, I have outreach. I have guests. I do helping new members get involved, spiritual growth. Those are kind of my focus areas there. Let me ask you this question. Who taught you to ride a bike? <clears throat> Does a name pop up and say what? Who taught you how to ride a bike? Your dad, all right. Anybody else recall who taught them? A friend taught you, all right. Think about this one. Who taught you how to pray? Don't answer that out loud. Just think about it for a moment. Who taught you how to pray? I think sometimes our teaching can be very direct. Somebody's instructing us like a bicycle of, hey, this is how you ride it, this is how you do your pedals. I think, think sometimes for a lot of us on prayer, it was something we observed maybe our parents doing, uh, a grandparent doing, a friend, but it may be more observing things that they said as opposed to maybe direct teaching like you have uh, with a bicycle. Um, so I want us to think about those when it comes to how are we making disciples within our congregation? There's kind of this direct, but there's also this observation learning that people get by being around other people. Um, who taught you to be a disciple of Jesus? Let me go that one for a minute. Who taught you to be a disciple of Jesus? And then who are you helping to be a disciple of Jesus? Well, reflect on both of those questions. So what, when I say that, let me see if this works. Yesterday it gave me some problems. Blaine. Oh, all right, there we go. All right. Um, all right, so what is a disciple? What do you guys think? All right, a student. I love that definition. A follower? Yes. All right, what is discipleship? You don't have to answer that one out loud. That one's more abstract, I think, a lot of times. Let's flip over to Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I think a lot of times when we think of a disciple, we think of a certain aspect of that, and that would be the creation of a disciple, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But I think we struggle a lot of times in that second part of it of what does that look like to teach them to observe all that I've commanded you to help bring them to the fullness of Christ. It's not just a conversion, but it is a follower, it is a student of Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 13, I think this is a powerful verse. I know I've heard it so far in the conference as well from other speakers. Other speakers. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ until we all obtain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. So as a church leader, what is your job? To equip, to equip yes? Say what? Yeah, right here. Like to me, this is a defining passage for me as a minister. I know some of you would have different roles. You may be a deacon, you may be an elder, you may help lead a ministry, um, but to some degree, you're probably leading. To me, this is it. And there's a couple things I want us to, to notice here. We're equipping the saints for ministry, for unity, for knowledge, and the fullness of Christ. I think that is gives us a glimpse of that complete picture of what should our flock look like as individuals, not just as a congregation, but as individuals, to me, this is the goal. Like we want a disciple of Jesus to be somebody that is involved in ministry. Uh, we see unity, knowledge, and fullness of Christ. I want to make a comment here that this unity, the way that I read this and how I see it, especially when you flip over like Acts and see the church, is not just an intellectual unity. 
Like it's not just a unity of doctrine, but I think it goes beyond that when we look at unity. Uh, so don't just think in my mind, okay, this is just a, a unity of faith where we all believe the same thing and we're not really connected. Like when, it, when you go back and you look at Acts 2, the unity that they had was intellectual, but it was also more than that in their lives of sharing their faith and being involved in each other's lives. Um, and we have the knowledge of the Son of God to the fullness of Christ. Wow. Talk about a big task. Like as leaders to say, okay, my, my job is to help those that are at my congregation, those that worship with me, to get to the fullness of Christ. Like I don't, how am I going to get there myself? <laughs> you know, like how am I going to maintain that? How am I going to get there? But that's, God calls, hey, church leaders, this is your task, is to equip the saints to accomplish these things. And what I want us to reflect on, some questions that I want us to dive into this morning is, how are we doing on that? Like, in all, in all seriousness, how are we doing that? And I'm going to present more questions than I am answers today. But I think a lot of times the most important thing is asking the right questions first as leaders. Um, so I want us to kind of get there today is, hey, honestly, like, how are we doing? When we're talking about, hey, we want disciples to go and make other disciples do we have disciples to begin with that can go out and make other disciples? So let's jump into this a little bit more. What is, a, what is discipleship in me, this idea of making disciples? There's a thing that I like to do in my ministry and my take on this is my goal is making and maturing disciples. Like I said, like if I can narrow down my focus in ministry, I want to make and mature disciples. Like it's twofold. Um, but to be a disciple of Jesus is to be committed to being transformed to be like him. It's a student. It's somebody that's learning under him. But it's an individual that says, I am committed to Jesus and I want to become like him. So for church leaders, I think we can view this, that process, as an intentional process to help believers in their commitment to be transformed to be like their Savior. That's our goal. That's our task that when we sit down and we look at our church family, what are we doing that's intentional to help them in their commitment to be transformed, to be like Jesus? How do church leaders define what it means to follow Jesus? What do you guys think? Do they have a role in that? Any thoughts? All right, to do the Father's will. That's definitely the goal. Um, let me reword it. What? Examples. All right, yeah, examples. And a word I could add in there is what influence do church leaders have on the definition of what it means to follow Jesus? So you definitely hit that. What we emphasize. In other words, if we never talk about that, it is never going to happen. Mm-hmm. I think you guys are right on. Yes. Answer this question. You know someone is a Christian when they do what? Not baptism, but when you look at their life, you know, okay, this person is a Christian when they do what? All right, love. All right, compassion. All right. Service. All right. I love all your answers. I, I think they're right. What I would suggest, a lot of people in our world would say they go to church. Um, like if you just ask somebody like, okay, you know this person is a Christian. What's a, a defining characteristic of that? I think most people in our country would say, oh, they, they go to church. Like, you may also throw in, oh, I know they love other people and they believe in Jesus, but I think a big defining characteristic is the idea of, okay, they're a part of a church. Like, I know they're a Christian. They, they go to church on Sunday. They have to miss this ball game because they have Bible study. You know, like, that seems to be, to me, at least in my world, a defining uh, characteristics of that. Let me ask you this. What are church leaders' expectations of you? Or if you're a church leader, what are your expectations of your church family. And you may be saying, well, I, 
I don't know, you know, like to follow the to follow the Bible, it may be a very broad concept, which is not bad. It may be to do the Father's will, which is exactly right. Like that is at the heart of it, of what we're trying to do. Um, but what does that look like? What is that in a tangible way? Or to be able to quantify that, what are your expectations for the people that are are part of your church family there? So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you. I think faith is very similar to love. Like in its truest essence, action follows it. Um, and. And to us, I think that should be our expectations. A question that I would have for us is, how often does that get communicated from the elders? Like if there's elders, I know it's some of you may be at a, a congregation where there's not elders. Um, I know we hear it sometimes being preached on. Is that the same thing as coming from the elders? Something to, to, con- to, uh, to consider there. Let me throw this out to you because I believe there's an incorrect understanding and view of what it means to follow Christ. Like, just on a national level, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to follow Jesus? I think there's a huge misunderstanding of what that is. Because I think a lot of people would say, oh, well, being a Christian is an intellectual thing. Like, I believe that a God exists and feels a complete separation from anything that is actionable or any, any idea of something being obedient. And the reason I say that is because if you take the, like, I, I try to use stats that were pre-COVID just because I feel like they were more, probably accurate and throwing off some of that stuff, but 65% of the U.S. calls themselves Christians, all right, would say, yes, this is, I'm a Christian, I'm a practicing person. Um, Weekly church attendance, or we'll start here, those that say, I'm a part of a church, like I'm, I have a church home, I'm part of a church. Um, If you backtrack just after 2020, you're looking at 50%, all right? So there is a 15% gap of those that say, Yes, I'm I'm a Christian, and those that say I'm I'm tied to a church, like a group of gathering of believers. Um, if you look at weekly attendance, you're going to see that we're about 29% said they uh, attend worship on a weekly basis. So you're looking at half of those that say yes, I'm a Christian, and then of those that say you know what I attend on a weekly basis, um, and that would just be like one time. Um, If you then look at those within our church context of saying, okay, how many people do we have on a Sunday morning? How many do we see back on another gathering, like to study the Bible? Maybe it's a Wednesday, Sunday night, uh, whatever that other context may be. A lot of places, 70% probably tops if Bible class is like right by Sunday morning worship. Um, Sometimes it's lower. It may be back to like 50%. Um, So you're going to see a decrease there. I thought this was interesting. Bible reading in America, uh, about 35% said they had read their Bibles in the last seven days. That didn't separate worship versus like personal Bible study. Another one did Bible users on your own. So it was like outside of a church gathering. This would be like by yourself. Uh, This is kind of how it fell out. Uh, Daily was about 11%. Four to six times a week was five. Um, two to three times a week was 9%, once a week was 9%, once a month, 8%. So if you look at those that confess, okay, I'm a, I'm a Christian, like I'm a believing Christian versus those that are part of a gathering versus those that are actually in the text, spending time with God, there's a huge gap between those that would say, mentally I'm a Christian, but in practice it would be a lot lower. And we could easily say, okay, well, that's the U.S. as a whole. Those that would be part of my church family, it's probably not that bad. But if we stop and we consider it, I think some of that mentality has creeped in to our churches as well, into our church family. This, this idea of, okay, I can be a Christian, but does that really line up with what we would say a disciple of Jesus is and what we see in the text and, and that standard of, of truly being somebody that's trying to be transformed to be like Jesus. Uh, I think this is interesting. There was another study done, and let me see what it was, or I'm going to tell you the wrong one. Um, It was the Center for Bible Engagement, 
they found a noticeable transformation when people engaged with Scripture four times a week. Um, at three, there would be like a little heartbeat on the map. This would be like it would help individuals like alcohol, alcoholism, uh, pornography, um, you name it, like these tangible things that they could see sin. There would be a little bit at three times a week. When you got to four times a week, there was a huge jump in them being transformed as individuals pursuing Jesus. So if you take that number of, okay, we're looking really at like four times a week in Scripture to really get something that is like moving people to become like Christ, there is this huge gap between what people think and what they're actually doing. Yes? These I tried to pull from like 2019 um, time frame. I tried to go pre-COVID. So they're recent, but I didn't, I, I kind of threw out the past year and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, so a lot of them are like... Anywhere between 2018 2020, I tried to stay before like COVID and stuff on those stats or whatever. Um, but I think if we see big picture, okay, if we're honest with ourselves, there is a separation in what people assume Christianity is and actually what a disciple is as a nation, but also within our church families as well. And I think that's a, a huge problem uh, for us. All right, so what about your church family. Is there any intentionality? Is there any prayer or communication on what disciples should be doing to be transformed? Think about that for a moment. For you as a church leader, what what things are you doing intentionally to help communicate, to help transform people to be like Jesus? And I think there's some things that we're doing that are great. Um, I think gathering for worship is great. I think Bible classes are great. But is that enough? Like to me, when I look at the trend of there seems to be this disconnection between intellectual, let me take in some things, and then also is it producing a full-blown disciple that we're trying uh, to get to. In Acts chapter 2, yeah. can you hit it for me, Blaine? All right, in Acts chapter 2, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were gathered, or all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I want to highlight a couple of things here. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You have fellowship, breaking of bread, prayers. There was an awe, uh, signs and wonders. They were together. They were selling their things. Uh, Day by day, they were attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes and praising God. When I see the early church, I see four pillars like that characterize who they are. I see worship. I see a Bible study gaining knowledge. I see a fellowship, true fellowship with one another. And I see serving as the other other aspect of that. And I throw that out because I wonder if we are adequately teaching those things to other people. I think sometimes we approach things as we assume those that are spiritually immature will do mature things. And what I mean by that is we, the way I perceive it is sometimes we think we can just tell people that this is what you're supposed to do and they will go and do it. And they will if they're a mature Christian. Like you can say, hey, you need to go and and pray. You need to go and read your Bible. You need to go and do these things. And a mature Christian or a mature disciple will just go and do those things on their own. But for somebody that is immature, that's a hard call sometimes that I think sometimes we assume, okay, all we have to do is like inform them of that and they will go and do those things. And I think that may be where in my mind, in my context of seeing ministry, there's a disconnect between those two. Let me ask you this question. Name three sermons, not out loud, just to yourself, three sermons that really transformed who you were as a believer. All right, just... In your mind, come up, come up with your list. Anybody done yet? 
I think it would be a scripture, Romans 12. All right. Two. Yeah, scripture, yeah. Oh. Um, and it could be a Bible class too, just a lesson on that. All right, now see how quick this will be. Name me three people that really transformed who you were as a believer. Man, I bet I bet you're up to five already. Like, and what what I'm I'm nervous about, I feel like sometimes is we will gather, we will praise, we'll worship together, we'll encourage them to go to a Bible class where they will be taught more about Scripture. And then there's some that have this, but there's some within our church family that that's all they get relationally with other Christians. That's all they get as somebody like mentoring them and helping guide them and, and helping teach them is all they get is the information without anybody actually walking them through that. And the same thing when it comes to, hey, what is it, who taught you how to pray? I feel like most of us observed that of other people in our lives that, that taught them how to pray. So it'd be one thing to say, hey, this is how you as an individual need to go share your faith with other people in your lives. How many people in our congregations have seen an elder share their faith with somebody else? And that's not an attack on elders at all. How many people in my, in my church family have seen one of the ministers share their faith? Not as teaching, but like in a context that would be similar to theirs. And I think that could be where some of the disconnect, if they go on a mission trip with us or something like that, they would get that experience where they get to go door knocking with one somebody else. And I've, I've had those experiences and they helped. Like to knock on somebody's door and to be able to hear this older person that has all this experience share their faith and pray with somebody and talk through those. But how many people in our church family are getting that type of setting? How many in our church family have served or done a visit with somebody else that is a spiritual leader that they could look up to? And it's one thing to say, hey, we need to go and we need to be hospitable. We need to open up our homes to our neighbors. Well, how many have seen other leaders in their church do that? Or, hey, we need to go and care for the sick. And those things are occurring. Like, they're definitely occurring. You know, like, but a lot of those things happen behind the scenes. To where unless you have those close friendships already built with other people, a lot of times people, I think, are on an island spiritually when it comes to practicing those and carrying those out in their lives. And when I see, okay, how did disciples get grown? Like, I had a, I was part of a Bible study last night and we were, we were working through uh, Philippians, and in, we were in chapter 3, and Paul's talking about two individuals that he was sending to them to help minister to their faith, and I think Paul's a great example of that, how many disciples he had, like Timothy, who was a son of faith, uh, to him, like they had that relationship. You see Jesus, what did he do? He had 12 that lived their lives with him to learn and to grow, and I think for us, sometimes there's a disconnect between, I think, what we see in Scripture and how we're actually functioning as a church and making disciples. Where so much of it, I feel like, is information-based and not actually helping walk people through that and helping them grow. Um, so, uh, some questions for us to ask. What do people need? And as church leaders, like we see, I think, at least I see a problem in that sometimes it's information, there's this misconception that Okay, as a Christian, all I need to do is go to worship. Maybe I need to be morally correct, but we're falling short in actually what it is to be a disciple. For somebody to fully be a follower of Jesus, where they're also going out and making other disciples. So some questions I think that are appropriate to ask is, what do people need to spiritually thrive? Not to survive, but to thrive. Like in your context, in your church, what do your people need to spiritually thrive? I think all of us need to, spend time reflecting on that, asking that question with other leaders is what do our people really need to thrive? And then what role should the church have in each other's spiritual growth? What does that look like? I'm a big believer in positive peer pressure. Um, I think there's a sense of celebration. There's a sense of joy being able to do things together with other people. I'll give you an example. Uh, been at two different congregations for pretty much all my full-time ministry thing. And we've both done something similar and they both had similar results or whatever. And it's not like just, oh, this one thing solves it. But in a fraction, it showed a little bit of growth. And we, Blaine will remember this because we did it just a couple years ago. And he was huge in putting this booklet together. But we did 40 days in prayer together as a congregation. And we had booklets and people wrote daily devotionals. And doing that together as a church family, there were several that said, 
wow, I had never really done that for 40 days to be disciplined and carry that through all the way. But because we did that as a church family, it helped me grow spiritually. Um, and the other one, other church where I did that, a guy actually had gotten up to lead prayer and started crying. And he said, I thought I was a man of prayer before I did this together with you for 40 days and doing that like with my wife. And that's an example of like positive peer pressure and stuff like that. So I see a role of the church being there to help people grow spiritually outside of just like our gatherings and stuff like that. Number two, as a congregation, what are we currently doing that is successful in aiding people and becoming like Jesus? And I'm going to guess there's things that you definitely can add to this list uh, for you that we're doing this and this is definitely helping people grow in their knowledge. This is definitely helping people grow in their worship. This is definitely helping people grow maybe in service or they're connecting here or this group. Maybe the women's ministry is rocking it and building relationships and mentorship. But hey, maybe our men's ministry is falling short in that or vice versa. Or maybe we have a great young married class where they're connecting with other people. But you know what? Our older population, they don't really have that where we're helping them still grow in their faith and things like that. So it's going to be different for all of us. Number three, what has helped you grow spiritually? Like reflect in your life, what is it that helps you grow spiritually? Like true growth, true transformation in your life. And is that something that you're now producing for other people? And then fourth, if the goal is to be Christ-like, are there certain results or benchmarks that we should be able to see along the way? Like our path is, hey, we want people to be a disciple of Jesus. What does that mean? What is the end result? Is it, hey, we think people should be serving in a ministry, their, their weekly gathering for a Bible study, they're coming to worship, what, however you would define what that is to be faithful. Hey, we believe it's somebody that is sharing their faith. And we're going to do whatever we can to make benchmarks along the way to where we can get people there. Um, and to me, I'm a big believer that the more abstract something is, the harder it will be to not get there. Like if it's just, hey, we want to be more like Jesus, like, Okay, that's really hard to, to quantify for somebody else. It's really hard to have short goals along like this week. Okay, what am, I, what am I trying to do? What's that next step? What should I be doing? Hebrews 13, 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their life and imitate their faith. As a church leader, I feel like this is a big passage, a, a big challenging passage, I think, for me. Because there's a lot of things that this assumes about me and those that are part of my church family. Remember your leaders, those that spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith means that there is a relationship there where they can do these things. They can consider the outcome of my way of life, like how I'm living, but also imitate my faith. Imitate your faith. And I think the question is, what are people exposed to my faith? Who's exposed to that? What are they seeing? What are people open to? And obviously, you're not going to be able to do that for every single person in your church family, for every single leader that you have. But I think we can step back and we can say, okay, this is a needed thing. How are we going to solve that? Not just one person for 500 people, but is there a way that we can put people in their lives uh, because this is a needed thing. Uh, let me backtrack real quick because there was something I wanted to say and, and I forgot on this one. I did this exercise and, and Blaine was part of this group and we don't have this figured out by any means, but we're exploring some of this. And with a group, it was a random gathering of, of people in our congregation. We were asking some of these questions like, what do people need to spiritually thrive? And here were some of their answers that they came up with. I wanted to share some of these with you. They said, Attention, belonging, and compassion. They said having someone invest in you. Intergenerational relationships. Um, and let me pause. This was a gathering of those that were retired all the way down to like my age. So this was just a handful of people uh, within our congregation. Um, opportunities to build, strengthen, and create relationships with other Christians. Accountability. Smaller groups for intimate connection to be vulnerable as individuals in a church, to learn from others, brought alongside, to serve and to teach. Man, that list there to me is hard to accomplish sometimes in our gatherings that we have. Like to hold somebody accountable, that's kind of hard to do on a, on a Sunday morning where we're gathering to worship and to celebrate. 
who God is. You know, like that's hard to do sometimes in a Bible class of like 50 people or whatever that may be. But all these to me that I see are relation driven. Like when we ask them, what do you need? What do people need to spiritually thrive? This is what they came up with on a list. And to me, that that's very challenging to me is how can we create as leaders avenues and context for people to have that? Because some people naturally will have that. Like they're outgoing. They're going to make connections with other people. They're going to build those relationships. But what do we do for the person that is coming in for worship and they feel good? Like all I need to do is show up for worship and I'll leave. Yeah. Yes. Uh, they said attention, belonging, and compassion. Having someone invest in you. Intergenerational relationships. Opportunity to build, strengthen, and, cr and create relationships with other Christians. Accountability. Smaller groups for intimate connection. Be vulnerable as individuals and a church. Learn from others. Brought alongside to serve and to teach. Uh, was there a list there? All right, so let me jump back here. Um, back to this question. Who taught you to ride a bike? Who taught you to pray? Some teaching is deliberate. Some is picked up by observing. Who do they see evangelizing? Who do they see sharing their struggles? Who do they see holding other people accountable? Who do they see serving? Who do they see setting spiritual goals and trying to, to reach those? Sometimes we expect immature people naturally to do mature things. And I think it's going to take a little bit more of discipling them to get disciples of Jesus. So what does it look like to establish a path forward? I think the question for us is, what is communicated to new family members and new Christians? Like when you meet with them as church leaders, what do you share with them of this is our expectation here of what we will do to follow Jesus? Like this is our expectation for you spiritually as leaders and, and I'm a, a caretaker of your soul to help you. This is my, our goal for you, that we think you need this to spiritually thrive. How are deacons discipling? To me, I think deacons are a great opportunity to help build other men in our congregation and leaders. If you have an individual that is leading a ministry as a deacon, like that's somebody that you see as a very healthy Christian. Like they're serving other people. You see them as a mature person to lead. Are they discipling somebody? Or are they just plugging people in to serve? And I think there's a, a difference there. Uh, there was a deacon a couple weeks ago that had asked me, his other partner was like leaving to go to Arizona. He was like, hey, I need somebody else to help with this ministry. And it was like, I think it was, Counting our contribution is what, what he was over. And I was like, hey, don't get somebody your age. I got somebody in my Bible class that I want you to, to take under your wing. Um, so I gave him somebody that was in their, their mid-20s. And I said, hey, this is a great guy. Like, you two go and do this. Like, that relationship in time is going to build a lot. With those two in that room, counting money and them having conversations. So what does it look like? For elders to disciple. One of my most influential elders to me in my ministry is a guy that he was discipled by an elder that was at that congregation before me and took him fishing. Like they both were fishing buddies and for years they they fished together. And in his mind, this I almost said his name, but in his mind, they were just out there fishing. It reminded me of the country song where the guy's talking about his daughter, like she just thinks we're fishing or whatever that is. Like that's what he... Yeah, Trace Atkins. All right, there we go. Um, anyways, he thought they were just fishing, but they weren't. Like, he helped this guy to be a very effective elder in the church because on that boat, they were talking about life. They were talking about marriage. They were talking about, hey, yes, your career is important, but this is what's most important in life. And it happened over years of a time. I remember our, this happened before I got there, but I know Mount Juliet elders, they had a Bible class where they were very open about this is what it is to be an elder. This is what it is to shepherd people. And they, in that class, tried to share a little bit about what that is. But for elders, I see, okay, if you're going to visit somebody in the hospital, have you ever taken a young or leader that or a potential like deacon one day and say, hey, this evening you want to go and make this visit with me? And maybe you grab dinner together beforehand. And you try to do that over years of time. This isn't something that is a quick fix overnight, 
but this is a change in culture of how we view things and what people need to spiritually thrive. And I think people need relationships. I know I need relationships. I need people that are older than me saying, yes, not that I'm spiritually struggling, I'm going to fall away from the church, but I'm nowhere near where I need to be. And I need people to say, you know what? I believe in Brian and I'm going to help him become more mature in Christ to reach that fullness of Christ. So to me, that's my challenge for us is when we think about making disciples, I think the one of the avenues of doing that is making sure our members are not just claiming Christianity, but they're actually disciples of Jesus. And the only way to get there is not going to be just information passing. It's not just going to be telling them what to do, but it is going to be showing them, walking with them, praying with them, holding them accountable, being transparent with, with your struggles and your own things. And I think one of that is, for an elder uh, or a church leader, how often do you have people in your home? That was something I wasn't good at early on. Like, I, I didn't do that. It's something my wife and I recently have, have started opening up our home to because we wanted to do more of this. Like, what does it look like for us to, to get to know people and to disciple one another? So what I mentioned on Thursday nights now, we have a Bible study in our home. Where we'll target certain individuals. Like, I'll pick some people that I think will go and do their own group. I'll pick some new members. I'll pick some people that are younger in their faith, pull them together, and we're just going to eat and study the Bible together. And then hopefully they will go and reproduce that with another group uh, so often. There's no quick fix. There's no right answer. But to me, I just want us to ask the right questions is, what do people need to spiritually thrive? Uh, so my challenge to you is when you go home, get with the other church leaders and ask that question together. Is what, does, what do our people need here to spiritually thrive? What are we doing to meet those things? And then where are the gaps? What can we do to fill that in? So, and I think over time we will change that culture of, hey, it's not just showing up on Sunday morning. It's not just mentally believing that Jesus exists, but it's about this committed disciple of being transformed to be like Jesus, a process that never ends. Um, all right, and then teachers as well. Uh, we only got like one more minute left. If you got a great teacher at your congregation, have them teach somebody else how to teach. Pair them with another young teacher that has potential and let them co-teach a class. And he can help train that guy of saying, hey, instead of asking this question, what if you did this? Or, hey, what if you, and they can walk through that together. Same thing with children's uh, Bible classes. Get uh, a new couple that just moved to your town and, and have one of your teachers say, hey, you want to you wanna co-teach with me? Um, I think that's kind of how we can do this on every level to actually minister and disciple one another and to build that up. All right, remember the goal. Be intentional in helping believers in their commitment to be transformed, to be like their Savior. Uh, the question I think is worth pursuing, it's worth struggling with, and I think this is something worth, worth failing at. Uh, to try it, we may do something and it may not work. Like That may be not a great way to disciple somebody, but I think it's worth the effort in that pursuit to try to make disciples. So I love you guys. I appreciate you. I love what you're doing in your context to grow the kingdom. And let's end with a prayer. Father, we thank you so much for Christ, his love for us, his willingness to die for us that we can uh, be a part of your family. Father, I pray that those within our church family can see that in us, that we are deeply committed to you, uh, not just for salvation, but that we want to be like you. And we believe that is the best path is to, is to put sacrifice, put in the hard work to be transformed, to be like you, to not settle with where we are spiritually, but to know that that's where peace can come from. That's where happiness can come from. Father, I pray that you be with us in our plans and our efforts to try to mold people uh, to want to pursue you because uh, we know when we can get a disciple to be a disciple, more disciples and more followers of you will follow after them. Father, we thank you so much for prayer. It is truly a gift. And I'll just pray in your son's name. Amen. All right, love you guys. Appreciate you. Hope you have a good rest.